Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Writers Speak Wednesday. We are joined by two poets tonight, Michelle Whitaker and Vijay C. Uh, Chaudhry. We're, ve we're very excited to have both of you here with us and want to thank you for joining us for this conversation. And thank you to all the viewers who tuned into the reading tonight. Uh, we're looking forward to answering all your questions a little bit later. Our first reader today, Michelle Whitaker, is a West Indian American poet, pianist, and university instructor whose interests include expository and creative writing pedagogy, music composition, 20th century American poetry, and eco-poetics. Michelle completed an MFA in creative writing and literature at Stony Brook University, Southampton. Her poems have been published in The New Yorker, The Southampton Review, Narrative, Vinyl, Long Island Quarterly, Transitions, Transitions Magazine for Hutchins Center, and other publications. Her debut collection of poetry, Surge, was published in 2017. Michelle was awarded a finalist medal for the 2018 Next Generation Indie Book Award for Poetry, as well as a 2017 NIFA Fellowship in Poetry, a Jody Donahue Poetry Prize, a Cave Conum Fellowship for African American Poetry, and a Pushcart Special Mention. Currently, Michelle is an assistant professor in the Program of Writing and Rhetoric at Stony Brook University. Michelle, thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, and thank you to uh, Lu Luann for the invite. Um, it's always nice to be back at CWL. Um, so I have a few poems um, here and the first poem is called Texting the Goodnight. When I think of us, I think of two open books named Radio Silence. And this reminds me we have never been well behaved as compartments. When my dentist notices I grind my teeth in my sleep, I imagine how my heart must punch through the mess of a hoarder's mind. This morning I noticed in the shower bruises on my knees and rug burns on my elbows again. Although the thought of ash burst stings, it shifts like petals of woodruff, sweet aster or yarrow, modified away from their reproductive parts. And when I stop talking to myself, the good night texts back that he misses me like a bland handed compliment or a stress relief for a mistress. But then again, I am not. So why do I dismiss the we? Why lament in a riddance of hair, spooling like formidable last stands? Why grip me as angst, white oleander? Why do I field mark embarrassment like the language of bird meat torn apart and taxed? And yet I have no appetite. Last week after sex, I answered, I was the first among my siblings. Why have I been seen as secondary? Doesn't love exist for the first line of defense was my last thought above ground on a westbound rail with no one around but that which lulled me into a study of discontentment. Look there, a lily pad on a subway wall, pixelated green, faking freedom, bodice like a padlock, while a sparrow imitates a kite. Blur, blur, their clapping wings say, but blurred hurt is what the string who held its hand heard. This next poem is called Fractures. I was on my way to a market I think with in Madrid when Mary said I looked lost again. Isn't it funny how the body continues to press for water even when there is little left? Mary said, I look like I lost weight. I mentioned that I broke my rosary beads on cobblestone in Montreal. Mary asked if I meant Madrid. I tried to say I was on my way through a market on a cobblestone street when I fell. Mary asked me if I'm okay. Isn't it funny how the humidity strips what's already weak? Mary half agreed. For when my eyes welled up into an aisle of stone, she confirmed this pain as a blessing and reminded me how it takes a very special person to leave you injured in a foreign place.
this next poem is um, actually part of a Stony Brook art exhibit by um, Anne-Marie Waugh. Um, her exhibit is called The Developer's Midnight Fantasy. Um, and so she used parts of this poem. It's like an e ecological uh, project. The Lovers in the Pine Barrens. Down and out, often nestled hand in hand, like two lone ticks found buried above the sternum. Watch them trance, watch them yawn wilderness into a night surge. Often down and out transmit their anesthetic touch to the other, deciding not to conceive children. Watch them head trip, watch them overthink themselves single as strobes through the pine lands while gorging through soil gullies of tar stumps and vanishing squawks. Watch them logging concerns, watch them split as they release cares about the rocky beaches, former self, the glacial physique. When down and out exchange vows subsequently, like the late stage of Lyme disease, watch them toggle in sickness and in needing help. Watch them uproot as a bright repeat. Frequently asked answers. The thought of my grandmother's death often visits the thought of Jesus cleaned and prepared for gravity. Even the clanging of symbols or catechisms against prayer wheels in the brain no longer lie grave. My oncologist outlining a group of disorganized nodules mirrors the grass plots of a Bahamian graveyard. The thought of reticence interrupts this drinking, drinking interrupts this dunderhead masking ovarian grief. The reality of being born again crawls in and out of bed and certain positions seem prone to restless scraping. Loving someone depressed and in self-denial deepens the daily routine for creating art. Like grievances circling her courtyard in front of a bed of geraniums, also diseased, as if deeming ourselves mapless or ageless, like a luminary acquiescence, or just tormented when virtue subsumes the blade. And my last poem is called Bonefish. At my birthday dinner, I chose the wood stove salmon, despite my ex love dictating from a parasitic medical book in his blood stained scrubs the way uncooked salt fish could infest stomach lining with tapeworm. Even when I silenced myself, blinking wildly away our intestinal tubing. His Russian dialect continue whispering bright light through the back door of my black hair. This took me from the present and I want to be present. I wanted to eat the wood stove salmon. I did not want to pretend this was not war or murder kicking through walls of generation of people heaped around a table as descriptors or dissenters as I looked down again at my very own plate of my girl grilled in her pink guts, as if to say, it's game over, hominid. Even when I could scale this into a slendro and still say, instead say, it's gamelon, honey. When will I understand about why gongs were going off in these indigenous islands, as I knew I should have just gone to the library's card catalog and memorized more than the words bonang and wayang. But instead, I turned away. So when the waiter asked, ma'am, is everything okay? How's the salmon? I kept thinking, how knowing better has me in a chokehold, as if burying another bones with my birthright. Instead, when the waiter asked, ma'am, how is everything? I stuck a fork in it and showed my teeth 
as nature has taught me when holding a knife to its neck saying, it's fine, it's all fine. Thank you. You have such a you have such a beautiful meditative quality to your to your poetry and and such like a sensitive depth to all the images. So thank you for sharing that. With, that was very lovely. Um, and then our our next guest, uh, <laughs> our next guest is poet, essayist, and critic Vijay Sishadri who was born in Bangalore, India and came to the United States as a child. He earned a BA from Oberlin College and an MFA from Columbia University. Vijay is the author of several collections of poetry, including Wild Kingdom, published in 1996, The Long Meadow, published in 2003, which won the James Lawlin Award, and Three Sections, published in 2013, which won the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. His most recent collection, That Was Now, This Is Then, was published in 2020 through Grey Wolf Press. His poems, essays, and reviews have appeared in many publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times Book Review, The Paris Review, Plowshares, The Three Penny Review, and The, Rail the Yale Review, and in many anthologies. Uh, Vijay has received fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Guggenheim Foundation. He has also been awarded the Paris Review's Bernard F. Connors Long Poem Prize and the McDowell Colonies Fellowship for Distinguished Poetic Achievement. Vijay has worked as an editor at the New York that the New Yorker and the Paris Review and has taught at Sarah Lawrence College, where he currently directs the graduate nonfiction writing program. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, I hope everybody can see me. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you for having me and thank you for that reading, Michelle. It was beautiful. Uh, it's nice to be here in Brooklyn and also be in Stony Brook. It's really miraculous. Uh, I'm gonna read uh, a few poems. And, uh, and I'll start with, uh, First poem in my new book, this is the book, which is appropriately called Road Trip. Road Trip. I could complain, I've done it before. I could explain. I could say, for instance, that I'm sick of being slaughtered in my life's mountain passes, covering my own long retreat, the rear guard of my own brutal defeat dysentery and frostbite and snipers, the mules freezing to death, blizzards whipping the famished fires until they expire, the pathetic mosquito notes of my horn. But instead, for once, I'm keeping quiet and maybe tomorrow or maybe the day after or maybe the day after that, I'm just gonna drive away down the coast and not come back. I haven't told anyone and I won't. I won't dim with words the radiance of my gesture. And besides, the ones who care have guessed already. Looking at them, looking at me, I know they know. When they turn their backs, I'll go. The secrets I was planning to floor them with? They were already packed in my trunk in straw, in a reinforced casket. The bitter but herbal and medicinal truths I concocted to revive them with? Tomorrow or the day after or the day after that, on the volcano beaches fringed with black sand and heaped with tangled beds of kelp, by the obsidian tide pools that cradle the ribbed limpet and the rock-bound star, I'll scatter those truths to the sea breezes and float the secrets on the waters that the moon reels in and plays out, reels in and plays out with a little votive candle burning on their casket. And then I'll just be there in the sunset's coppery sheen, in the dawn pearled by discreet oblong intimate clouds that move without desire or motive. Look at the clouds. Look how close they are. Uh, 
This next poem is called Meeting. I'll meet if you really want to meet. I'll even meet in some small cafe or some park across the way. But I won't meet for long. And not for a minute will I look at you in your isolation, your human isolation. Looking at yours makes me look at mine. Transparencies of each other are they, yours and mine. And I don't have time for mine, so how could I have time for yours? When I knew you, I had time for mine. When I knew you, imagining my skeletal, streaming, solitary, oceanic swimming enlarged my dignities. Not anymore. No time for the nostalgias, infinite, infinitesimal, and the ones in between. No time to pretend I can sustain anyone or even understand how they feel, to show by the grave downward turn of the face, the haunted eyes, the image of an impossible inward stricken empathy. The contradictions are unsupportable, and I don't have time to not support mine, so how could I not support yours too? I don't even have time to write this text, See how uninflected it is? Without rhetoric, expatiation, form, concreteness, geography, weather, flora, fauna, plain and bare, which shows you I'm sincere. No Delnali, no great rift, no seven year trillium, and not one Phoebe in the woods getting ready to sing. Poem is called Birding, as in ornithology. A gray bird with a crest and a black mask, gilt edges, the slim tail feathers. An eye drop of arterial blood in a flask of gray water is the flashing red under the wing. A large waiter, gimlet eyed, under the sun's gimlet eye spearing frogs in the cattail marsh. The sun itself, a larger bird, its wings manufacturing the solar wind that devours, that is what can devour a person, floating in the vacuum of perpetual space, which is what there is and also is itself a bird, a black bird, its black eye, black and black. It's sidewise look that makes you look back. This poem is called Enlightenment. It's all empty, empty, he said to himself. The sex and drugs, the violence especially. So he went down into the world to exercise his virtue, thinking maybe that would help. He taught a little kid to build a kite. He found a cure, and then he found a cure for his cure. He gave a woman at the mercy of the weather his umbrella even though icy rain fell and he had pneumonia. He settled a revolution in Spain. Nothing worked. The world happens, the world changes. The world, it is written here, in the next line, is only its own membrane. And, oh yes, your compassionate nature, your compassion for our kind. City of Grief 
No one needs an explanation here for what happened. It happened is the explanation. No one here belongs to a race, an empire, a nation, only to this unmappable landlocked film noir city situated in eternity. They live by night here. The time here is local time. The crime is local crime. The girl with the name she stole from her dead sister, the dead man in the lake, know that things are forever the same. Sameness is their essence. Nothing here is sinister because nothing is at stake. Everything is null and void of depth, of resonance, not real, but celluloid. Yesterday was yesterday. Today is today. And no one cares why one becomes the other. No one but the private eye, that is, the gumshoe, the bird dog standing in for us, our body double, our fedora sporting anachronistic obsolete consciousness, who is always tortured by what he can't understand, who hires himself to investigate himself, who cooks his dinner for one and tries to think through what can't be thought through. The black wine is aerating, the pasta is limp and waiting to be sauced and tossed. There is a clue to find. There is an innocence to establish and an anguish in him he needs to destroy before it destroys him. An anguish so pure it almost feels like joy. And uh, I'll end with the last poem in the book, since I started with the first poem in the book. And uh, it's called To the Reader. And you can adjust that title in your minds to To the Listener, but I'm going to read the poem the way it appears on the page. To the Reader. I'm writing this so I can tell you that what you're thinking about me is exactly what I'm thinking about you. What you're reading is exactly what you're writing by the light of a taper deep inside yourself at your walnut secretary. These words are saying what those words say and these and those are those and these, mine and yours and have no meaning, only form. Talk about being one with others. We correspond one to one and there is a grandeur in this. You'll understand that someday. Just now, though, you're stupefied at this spooky action at a distance. So would I be, and I am. Thank you. I love how a uh, seamlessly shift between this carefully uh, evocative image and this sort of like surrealistic, almost like dreamlike pace, like reflection. And there's so many wonderful layers to your work. So thank you for, thank you for sharing them. Uh, I suppose now we can <laughs> move into a conversation about poetry. Uh, I have a few questions for you. And then at this time, if any viewers have any questions uh, for our poets, you can feel free to post them into the chat on the YouTube page and I'll make sure to share them with our guests. Um, so for starters, uh, what, what drew you to poetry? Uh, what do you like about the poetic form that you find is missing in, in other forms of writing like, like prose or? Michelle, do you want to take it or me? Oh, you can go ahead. Okay. That beautiful reading, by the way. It was yours. It's really nice. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, people, that's a question that people ask. And uh, over the years, it's, you know, it's always thrown me. And over the years, I've come up with a reason why it's thrown me and I've come up with a response that is, I think, adequate to my experience, which is that I was never drawn to poetry. I was drawn to poems. You know, in fact, I think 
there was something in my image of myself that always thought of my, that, uh, w something in my image of myself was such that I always kind of thought of myself if I were going to be a writer, to be a prose writer. And I write prose. And, uh, and I think the first real venture I undertook was prose. You know, the first like serious literary adventure was an attempt to write a novel which failed, which was, I started when I was 20 and I kind of abandoned it by the time I was 23. And, uh, but it was just that I fell in love with individual poems. And it was out of that that slowly kind of the desire grew, you know, and, uh, and the need to write poems grew. It never kind of antedated in any way my actual encounter with living poems, you know, and, uh, and so, and then it just sort of took over in some weird way, in a way that I don't quite understand. And I resisted it and I still resist it. You know, part of my activity as a poet is somehow resisting poetry. And I think since I published my book, the only thing I've written is prose, you know, you know which seems, you know, it doesn't get into, you know, it gets into the passions, but it doesn't get into the passions as nakedly as poetry does, you know? So you feel like you know, it's a more grown up thing to do. Is that a, you know, I guess that's not fair because ultimately it isn't, but you know, the world thinks it's more grown up to write prose. So. If that's an answer, I don't know if it is or not. Yeah, no, that that's I I mean I I think I just came into it through really cool teachers um, in I guess middle school, junior high, high school. It just seemed like a pattern. Um, I really adored my English teachers. They really loved poetry. Um, I was a little bit of a stutterer and um, I had to take more time. I, I felt than other students to sort of contextualize information. Um, and my teachers would make me write out the prose, like summer, summarize like texts. I found it really um, irritating, <laughs> but uh, eventually it, I sort of enjoyed the habit and they got me into writing in diaries and I liked picking out the, you know, different types. And, um, and that's where I started writing, whatever you want to call it, imitating whatever they were teaching. Um, and a lot of my English teachers like to talk about life, right? Um, life cycles, um, I would often have lunch with them and students and they would share books they were reading. And um, actually um, one of the first black teachers that I had in high school um, was an English teacher. And I, I think she moved. Um, it's been a long time, but I, she moved and she had gifted me this um, poetry and art book. So it was like different time eras. And I used to read that over and over. And um, I'm a feeler. I mean, I was, I was a composer and a pianist and I was very drawn to sort of uh, the romantic or surrealist or, you know, these different time periods that made me really feel something um, even in like social issues. So I think there's just a natural progression that I it didn't really feel like I had to prove anything. You know, nobody needed to know that I wrote a poem for years, you know. So um, it's just surprising how it, you know, I ended up years later being like, I want to be in a room with other people who want to be reading poems. That's pretty much what it was. Yeah. So. So we have, um, we have a question from one of our viewers, uh, True Main. Uh, for both poets, does a poem begin with an idea or a feeling? Well, as I, since I am a feeler, I feel my way through the world. Um, meaning like I, 
I think most of my teachers uh, were pretty insistent that, you know, the first stage is to be able to observe the world. Um, it doesn't mean you're always right in your observations, but like to be quiet, observe, detail, you know, start generating what it is you think you see, and then, you know, research and investigate. Um, but I'll just say that I know naturally I'm a person that also goes off of like kind of gut instinct too um, with that. And um, yeah, so I think, I think it could be either, uh, just depends. But I think my early stages was definitely more a little bit on the cathartic side. And then as I got into a discipline, I realized, oh, as long as I'm writing every day, who knows what will come up? That was the fun part to sort of discover. Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, I think I would like also have to kind of interrogate that question itself, you know, because I think if the one thing I would say, thinking about all the different ways my poems have begun, the one thing that they might have in common for me is that there's a rhythm there somewhere. And that rhythm might be associated with an image. It might be associated with an idea. It might be associated with a feeling. But the one necessary ingredient is a sort of a rhythm that forms into a phrase somehow. That there is in poetry, and I think in prose writing too, a fundamental rhythmic percussive musical element that is the generating energy. And it's very hard to kind of pinpoint what I mean by the word rhythm, by, by the word rhythm in this case. And, uh, you know, but I think all people who write poetry understand that. There's so many phrases that you come up with and they're sort of dead on the page. But then suddenly there's a phrase that's very alive on the page. And what is it that that phrase has that's somehow magical? You know, I mean, you know, for example, in that poem meeting that I read, for me, the first line, I'll meet if you really want to meet, generated the whole poem. And that had feeling to it, but the feeling was totally private. What was public was the rhythm. I'll meet if you really want to meet. And it's very, very simple, but for me, it was generative. Like it was like a seed that contained the entire rest of the poem. And the poem naturally developed out of that rhythmic paradigm, you know? So I think, you know, what's important if you're writing poetry is to think more about the fact that you're making a kind of music as sort of Michelle alluded to, that the musical element is fundamental. This is language organized as a certain kind of sound experience, as a sonic experience. And that sonic experience is fundamental. And it's what, you know, a very abstract poet and a very kind of concrete psychological poet will have in common, you know? <laughs> It's like what unites the intellectual poet and the emotional poet. I was, uh, I was having a conversation with someone uh, a while ago now, and she had a music background and she was saying music functions like that, where the instrumental uh, layer sort of is an emotional sort of undercurrent. And then you have the logic of the lyrics. So it, I like that you bring that up with poetry too, as that sort of like you have the tension between the intellectual and the, and the emotional that you're always kind of working with and balancing with like the, the sonics and the, and that, the literal meaning of, of the words. Um, we have another question from Laura Tucker. Uh, for Michelle. Um, I love your use of nature, insects, animals in your work. How do you conjure the imagery? Does the feeling come and the animal personifies it? Um, thank you, Laura, for that question. Um, I think part of it comes from growing up on an island and, and observing how it's changed over the, I would say, 40 years. Um, and um, 
you know, I've, I just been over the years, just been thinking about, well, like, what is my role in talking about how I'm talking about nature? Um, am I being responsible? Am I being too romantic? This is just personal choices. So obviously they're beautiful poems that live in the abstract of nature, the romanticism, the sort of brutal, uh, you know, reality of it. So um, I'm not always sure what the poem wants to say about it, but it's just definitely um, um, a surprise to me. I don't necessarily set out to, to build metaphor or if I'm, if I'm understanding the question. Um, but I think most of the animals and it's probably based off of real life, like observation, how they move around, how I move around them. Do I give them space? Do they give me space? How, how do I violate their, so I have a number of poems that seem to be in conversation with each other and those like complexities. Um, I just, I, I guess I kind of think back to, um, there's this essay that I teach from um, uh, Sir, Nard, um, Sir uh, William Bernard called The Human Prejudice. And there's a, a line in there that says, you know, does the tiger have the right to defend itself as I have the right to defend myself? Um, that sounds really violent. I don't mean it to be, but I just sort of seem to linger on that philosophical question. Like just what is my role? And in poetry, I feel like as we, we just heard um, this other beautiful reading um, that was very philosophical to me, like I can sit with those poems over and over, um, which I, I think might be also drawn to some of this, the same types of um, questions about nature in our, in our role. I don't know if that answered it, but. I like how you um, you talked about, like it's a lot of like observing the world and drawing from that. And uh, speaking about that, um, there was an interview that Vijay gave and he was talking about consciousness, I think. And you said um, that consciousness, bringing consciousness into a poem, it, it's like the opposite of large and it's, it's uh, like it's close to you. So it's like smaller. So that was just making me wonder like what smallness is in life. Do you experience as the most poetic and like, and then bring that into your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that a question for me? Yeah, for anyone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that, you know, what Michelle was saying about nature was really interesting because you know, I think our essential transactions with the world, with reality, the things that are the most real, which I feel, you know, are the province of poetry, really have to do with our recognition of a shift in the scale of the world, right? That in some sense, if we encounter nature in the form of an animal, we are encountering these vast processes that are reduced to the concrete fact of this creature, right? And, uh, and so it's what is poetic for me in those situations is the shift in scale, not just that we're thinking about the large and the small, but the large and the small somehow reversed in some way, that the thing that is really particular suddenly becomes cosmic, becomes universal, and that, you know, the pursuit of poetry or the pursuit of reality, I think, you know, for people who don't write poetry at all, but are still enmeshed in this reality, is the recognition of that, that constant shifting thing, which is mediated by our consciousness, you know, our consciousness tends to see the large and the small and the small and the large, and uh, everything in between. And that in some sense, the purpose of the poem and the purpose of literature and of art is to kind of make that embodied in some way, you know? So I kind of, uh, you know, I mean, I use the word consciousness, but 
it's such an inadequate word for this really strange thing that we are, that we know we are this thing, that we have self-awareness, you know, and that increasingly over my life, that has become the like fundamental mystery to me. Yeah. Not that we write poems, but that we can write poems. I mean, wow, that's just amazing. You know? Yeah, and that essay actually that I was talking about ends on that point. Really? <laughs> yes, he said yeah. that's what makes us, you know, complicated as an animal. Yeah. That we're constantly, like in awe, like we're in conflict <laughs> all the time in our mind. Sure. sure, we're half in and half out all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. So we have another question from Luann, uh, and she asks, can you both speak a bit more about the public and the private in terms of creation and ultimately the sharing of work? Hmm. You can go first. <laughs> you go first? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's interesting. I just gave a reading, a Zoom reading to the of all places, the Toronto Psychoanalytic Society for a Zoom conference they had in lieu of the actual conference they have every spring. And, uh, you know, and I brought up this quote in the sort of Q&A and the conversation afterward by uh, W.R. Winnicott, who was uh, one of the great object relations analysts and from the British School of Ob object relations psychoanalysis, the school that was started by Melanie Klein. And he says something that, you know, every poet understands immediately. He said, it is a joy to be hidden and a disaster not to be found. And I've always thought, well, that is the real, that's the condition of every poet I know, you know, that the whole process of writing poetry is such a deeply hidden process, you know, and at the same time, they're compelled to kind of have a public role for their poetry, at least all the poets I know, you know, they try to publish, they read, they share their poetry in one way, shape or form. And, uh, you know, and that's another one of those paradoxes of human consciousness that something so intensely personal and private, even though, you know, if, and this doesn't mean like we're all writing confessional poetry. You could be writing poetry that has no confession to it at all. But if it's really poetry, it's going to have an intense degree of privacy to it. Now, it's going to, if it's going to work as a poem, it's going to somehow be shaped by the very unique thing that you are, that no one else is. And uh, yet we live in language, which is something we share. And we share our poetry in these theaters, such as this one. And, uh, and it returns to that, you know, the relationship between the public and the private, I think, is one of eternal conflict. And it's like fundamental to our schizoid nature as human creatures that we crave both, we can't have the one without the other, you know? I mean, Pascal famously said that all human problems come from the fact that men are unwilling to sit quietly in their rooms, right? But if we all sat quietly in our rooms, like you wouldn't have war, you wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't be giving each other terrible viruses and, you know, like all this stuff comes from you know, our unwillingness to be alone or desire to share or, you know, it's like, you know. there again, there's no answer there. That's a question that's rich and deep, but, you know, it leads into more questions and more problems, you know, like all good questions do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with everything said. 
I also feel, um, feel right. Um, I'm not going to say think, but you know, I, I'm really happy about <laughs> being private for the years that I kept it private. Um, not everybody needs to know the levels of which I was trying to work out certain things, right? That might scare some people. Um, but I do ask myself, um, even today, um, like, why do I, ha- why do I need to share this though? Um, when you move into the community, however you want to define that, um, there are some people who, you know, they seem almost offended if you don't share, you know, say so you go to a reading and you're sitting as audience and listening and taking it in. And, and there is a privacy in that, that, you know, you have to just be quiet, just listen. You don't, you get to ask questions here, but there's lots of readings where you don't, you know, maybe you will ask that person in privacy later, you know? Um, so I think my why has turned more into, well, how can I serve more as a citizen in the community? Um, like, what does that mean? You know, how can I serve? Um, how can I help? Um, and yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's been really rewarding um, and maybe even healing at times, especially in like these times where like I'm in a, you know, I'm facilitating a workshop and one of the, the, you know, students is a 30 year retired police officer who's trying to work out some, something on the page, you know? Um, I, I think that those kind of conversations is really amazing. Um, and I feel like, sure, you can do that in prose, but I do think there's, strangely enough, there's something a little more private in the poetry realm, uh, you know, as was you know said before, it doesn't have to be confessional. Like there's all different ways to sort of enter into different types of dialogue with those kind of subjects. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is when you share a poem, you really you just don't know who needs that poem. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe nobody needs it, yeah. but I find I find over the years that like maybe one person at least was like, that's something I was thinking about. You want to talk about it? <laughs> and then that opens up a new dialogue. And if I'm being fair, you know, my poems are in dialogue with other poets who've come before me. And that's a way I'm, I feel like the private moves a little bit into the public, weirdly enough. Um, so public's de- defined in a different kind of way in my head. Yeah. Um, so hopefully some of that makes a little bit of sense. Thank you, Luann, for the question. So there's a sort of like sacredness to the, the internal space. So it's like, oh, it's almost like that risk of like sharing what you value, not knowing if others outside will value. So is that sort of like a... I mean, that's kind of like a difficulty with poetry because it's more vulnerable, would you say, or more subjective than maybe like fiction distances, but something about um, how poetry engages with like thoughts and emotions brings you closer to that that vulnerable space, maybe. I don't know. Um, I think it can, sure. Um, and I think it, it, it draws certain people because it can, if that makes sense. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm much more willing than the kind of average American to sort of think of myself as incorrigible in some way. You know what I mean? That like, you know, my deepest and purest impulses often get tangled up with you know, my most shallow and superficial ones, you know, that, you know, 
And like, if I write a poem that I think is really good, that I've broken through, you know, like I want other people to say, wow, that's really great, Vijay, you know, you really hit it out of the park that time, you know, that's sort of, and I can't, I can't at this point distinguish in simple ways those sort of complicated motivations and responses that go into the act of making a poem, you know, because we are such a mixed bag as humans, you know, there's so many things that are going on in us. And, uh, you know, and the only virtue I think with regard to poetry is that if you bring all of that to the poem, you know, then in some sense, you can contribute that reality to someone else and they can see that, you know, I mean, the, the most gratifying comments I've had just like Michelle are when, you know, like out of the blue without my expecting it. And, uh, someone will say, oh, this poem really helped me or it really moved me. Or, you know, and recently someone told me about a poem of mine that it made them feel much less lonely, you know? And, and I never expected that response, you know? I didn't know, well, wow, you know? That's kind of great. And, but that's, those are not the things you're actually writing for. You don't really know that you're writing for that. It's only in the aftermath you realize, oh, that was really, you know. So there was kind of justification in that one connection to that one person that made, you know, the fact that you put the poem out there in the world uh, reasonable and acceptable and a good thing. And, you know, rather than an attempt to draw attention to yourself. Yeah. Uh, I wonder um, what motivation kept you writing early on in your development as poets and writers and like, how has that motivation sort of changed or matured as you've lived more and, and written more? Like has, has the motivation for, for why you're writing or what you're writing shifted in any way or has it been pretty consistent? Well, I just, I read a lot of poets <laughs> and uh, I enjoy that. I'm not, uh, no shame for the poets who get jealous of other poets. I'm not really that poet. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if it's the music background, but I just, I get excited if I see something. Just that excites me or it makes me think about the world in a different way. I just try to sort of figure out how do they get into that? Um, or I want to know a little bit more about them or their- Do you carry, do you carry specific uh, writers or poets' voices with you that you like to bring in, like as an influence? Like, do you have any ones that you could name for us? <laughs> oh, um, there's just way too many. Uh, I mean, I have I've like anthologies of, and so, um, you know, I'm not going to name specific people, but, um, I do think, you know, at some point it's similar to um, being an interpreter at the piano, right? Like, um, you know, five people can learn a particular like Chopin prelude and it's all, even though the notes are there and the, the rhythm is there and even, even um, like how it should be expressed is, is written there, I mean, all five will be interpreted differently, which is sort of the beauty about like listening to performance. And um, that's kind of how I feel. Like, even if there's certain poets and poems I revisit, I always find something a little bit new or they feel different depending on something, you know, I'm going through. Um, you know, I, I've had some health issues recently. So when you talk about motivation, I don't really want to get too much into it as I just had a major surgery. Um, but I'm finding difficulty writing, to be honest. But um, I've talked to a few other writers who've gone through um, similar, um, I guess, life event. And it seems like a normal part of the process. So 
you know, I think it will return, you know, the process. But I'm, uh, I'm a little bit frustrated because I get ideas, but I'm a little bit fatigued. Um, no, uh, no, that's no, not, not quite the right word. I just, I don't, I don't know if that might, it just might be a different type of vulnerability. I feel pretty vulnerable in my work, like, but I think there's something about the body, maybe just being involuntary and doing its own thing that now I'm <laughs> a little bit like, I feel like I'm watching from the outside and I'm a little distracted by that. Can you still find refuge in other uh, creative parts oh, like sure. music? Yeah. And, I'm yeah. still reading. I'm reading other people's manuscripts and having great conversations and teaching and, and inspired by other writing. But um, I feel a little sad that I can't quite yet, you know, come back into my own voice, strangely enough. It's definitely coming back, but it's been... It's been a few months. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not something you can force, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can only have faith. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for me in terms of what motivation is that after at a certain point, the things you have written sort of generate the motivation, you know? When you're starting out, you're aspiring to find your vision and forge your identity. And once you've gotten past that phase, it's kind of seeing the Not the limitations, but the kind of the things that the way you wrote foreclosed, those things become interesting to you. So what you did before is something that generates what you are going to do in some way. I mean, I think there has always been a sort of feeling when I look at the poems that I've written that I have to move in a new direction. And I never know what that new direction is, you know? And that's the terrible thing about a poem. If a poem is a good poem, it's, you, you've, you're almost starting from scratch every time, right? All of the things you've learned have just brought you to this place. You can't really rely on them anymore. You know, there are certain instincts you've picked up that you, you can rely on but that's it, you're still now in this totally, you know, untouched wilderness that you have to work your way through and kind of establish a settlement there for yourself. And that first work is really, really hard. You know, and, uh, and I kind of, uh, you know, I mean, writing is one of those things that the better you get, the harder it becomes. You know, one of those very few things. And, uh, and that's like a real problem for all of us, I think. And, uh, you know, some people have a tremendous will about it. They're not gonna, you know. And others, you know, like curl like me, I curl up into a little ball and go and kind of groan and moan in a corner going, oh my God, you know. So, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's eight o'clock, so I'm not going to hold you both too much longer. Um, I right. just want to thank you so much for the the wonderful discussion and the insights and for answering our viewers' questions. Uh, we really appreciate you making the time to be here with us tonight. Yeah. Um, it was just it was just a lot of great knowledge that you shared. So so thank you. Um, and then just a reminder for our viewers that if you would like to subscribe to this YouTube channel, you will receive uh, updates on upcoming Writer Speak Wednesdays. Uh, the next one will take place on October 13th, I believe, and then that's going to be followed by a faculty reading in November. Um, and then once again, thank you so much for joining us. And it was so nice to get to talk to you both. And I hope you all have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you.